people to and from church, and uh, they've got some activities going on. So she's at the It's a privilege to be able to once again address some things I think are of importance and relevance to us today. The song mentioned about scoffers, the days of scoffing aren't over by any, any means. It says that it's on. Is it on? Time for, there we go. Well, I thought I was okay up here, but uh, not always is that the case. So it sounds like you're able to hear a little bit uh, better now. There's been a big public row this week. You perhaps have been hearing about it in the news. When I talk about the days of scoffing not being over, front page headlines in one of the New York newspapers, God isn't fixing this. Well, that's what the scoffers said when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Oh, well, he saved others, but doesn't look like he's able to save himself. If you are, in fact, the Son of God, why don't you come down off of the cross there and prove it to us that you're really who you say you are? Because we don't think you are. We think you're just another charlatan. We think you're just another ruse. We think you're just a false prophet. We don't think you are who you say you are. Now, we've got to do something about this mayhem and violence in this country and easy access to uh, armaments. And uh, we've, we can't just be sitting around praying. What's praying been doing for you folks? I don't see that praying's accomplishing a whole lot. When there's mayhem and destruction and Christians call for prayers, how ridiculous can you get? Well, when we take a look at the story today in Scripture, beginning in Genesis 39 and onward, we find elements that Hollywood loves. In fact, this story has all of the elements that Hollywood enjoys to have when it tries to do a production. Well, long before Hollywood, we find that uh, individuals could pick, get themselves into all kinds of pickles and problems and whatnot. So when we take a look at our material today, it can appear that God isn't fixing this either. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, eventually was put into prison for false, by false accusation, and one of his buddies in prison, the cupbearer, said, oh yeah, I'll remember you when I get out of prison, and I'll make mention of you to the Pharaoh, and we'll make things straight. And when he gets out of prison, he forgets about Joseph, and Joseph stays in prison for another two years. So we've got unjust prison sentences, and that causes controversy in our country today about people who are in prison unjustly uh, serving time. So let's take a look at some of the things and some of the elements that we find in this story in Genesis 39 onward that uh, Hollywood loves, and well, people kind of like taking a look at it themselves. If we listen to our culture around us, there's nothing more sinful, nothing more evil than slavery. We find that within our story today, so let's mark that up on the bulletin board here. As let's uh, go with that one. There's nothing more evil than trafficking in slavery, and we find brothers here who are, in fact, engaged in such activity. When I say trafficking, it looks that Joseph is about 17 years old, which means he's, in our culture, underage. And you see a group of individuals willing to sell their own flesh and blood down the river into slavery. But we don't need to stop there. We see here that there is alleged thievery when we find a cup in Benjamin's sack of grain. We find uh, plotting and conspiracy to commit felony, capital offense, with evil heart and evil intent. There is premeditation, there is planning for this evil act to happen, and that is to uh, get rid of Joseph one way or another, either by killing him, or as it turned out, why should we do this for nothing? I mean, if we're going to get rid of Joseph, we might as well get a few shekels out of it. Now they're thinking like business people as well. So they're going to make money off of this chicanery as well. So they sell him for 
20 pieces of silver, and those guys end up down in Egypt and sell him off to, uh, to uh, Potiphar. As far as Joseph is concerned, it looks like a pretty bleak future. Even after Potiphar gives him responsibilities over his whole household, and the only thing he doesn't have responsibility over is Potiphar's wife, but everything else has been given to Joseph to look after and to take care of, even then he's still a slave. When Joseph's brothers head down to Egypt, as far as they're concerned, we're not going to be seeing Joseph anywhere along the line. They figured he was dead. There was no premonition in their minds that Joseph would ever be a person they would ever meet up with again. This would be something in your wildest dream could not possibly ever happen. And that's why Joseph was able to do a number of things with them, disguise himself, and it didn't dawn on them even with a flicker that they might be dealing with their brother when they were standing before him. Oh, a few years before, Joseph's own dad mocked Joseph. Oh, so you think mother and I are going to be bowing down to you as well? Not only these brothers here, but good old mom and dad are going to be bowing down to you as well. Is that what you think, Joseph? Come on, Joseph, get a, get a life, get a handle on things. Stop daydreaming and uh, get with the program. So it looks as though God is not going to fix anything when it comes to Joseph's life. Oh, yeah, Joseph gets blessed. The Bible says that uh, the Lord blessed the household of Potiphar and blessed Joseph as a result of uh, his management of Potiphar's uh, goods. But even as I've said already, he was still a slave, and that was going to continue to be the case. So let's pick up on our story. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Iskar, and Zebulun had all uh, gone out to uh, tend to animals, and Joseph was uh, commissioned to go and check in on them. And when Joseph uh, found them, they weren't too happy to see Joseph coming because their life was much easier without being around Joseph and all his daydreaming and whatnot. And Dad's preferential treatment had just made a sour taste in the mouth. It was like eating too much sugar. How much more of this sugary stuff can we take from good old Dad toward Joseph in particular and Benjamin as well? So they decided to see about uh, getting rid of him. Well, they did. And... As time passes by, we see that there is famine in the land. And one day we see father and the brothers, the sons, all standing around wondering what to do about the famine. And dad had a rather contemporary conversation. Went something like this. Why are you guys all standing around? We got nothing to eat. Why don't you all head down to Egypt because there's supposedly food down there. And we might as well go down and purchase some. So let's get on with the program. So down to Egypt they go, and they don't particularly have a very good experience because they are accused of being spies. That's a rather contemporary kind of scenario we sometimes see as well. People end up over in Iran, and before long they're being accused of being spies. That's just to take a contemporary example. Well, that's what happened here with Joseph accused these guys are being spies. We know why you came down here to Egypt. Yeah, you're telling us you came down here to get food, but we really know what you're down here for, and that is to uh, spy on us and uh, see what you might be able, what other chicanery you might be able to get into. So Joseph said, in order for you to have any grain to go back uh, home with, one of you is going to have to stay. So Simeon uh, ended up having to uh, stay behind, and the rest of them went back home with this message. Do not come back without your younger brother. If you come back, you're going to get nothing if you don't bring your younger brother with you. And so the brothers all went back home. The food got consumed. And once again, there was a conversation with good old Pop about, let's go back down to Egypt and see about getting some food. The son said to Dad, but Dad, we're not able to go back down unless Benjamin goes with us. Well, how, how's that again? Yes. He told us exactly, specifically, do not come back down here to Egypt without your um, uh, youngest uh, brother in tow. Well, how does he even know about your brother? Well, because he asked about him. 
Well, what did you have to offer it for? Because he asked straightly whether or not your father was still alive and whether or not you had any other brothers. How are we supposed to know what he was going to do as a result of, of the information? And so it is that we find Judah having a conversation with his dad about how he would go uh, surety for his youngest uh, brother, Benjamin. And we see here the beginnings of a change of heart and mind, how it took years for the Holy Spirit to be able to work on the heart of these brothers of Joseph. Joseph ends up providing some tests as we go through this story. These tests give us a picture of what the investigative judgment is about. This story about Joseph and his brothers presents a number of types that we see anti-type or anti-typical figures uh, later on. So the investigative judgment is found within the confines of this story. Joseph tests them to see what their character is, what kind of person that they are. And we might have a discussion after church as to whether or not it was advisable for Joseph to be putting cups inside of a particular person's grain and then accusing him of being a thief, we might say, well, now that's not how Christians are supposed to act. Nonetheless, it's a part of the story, and Joseph was in the process of uh, testing them to see whether or not they had a change of heart and mind. So they go back down to Egypt. The youngest brother is in tow because Judah has said that he would go surety for his brother. Now Solomon would say to individuals, do not go surety for anyone. Do not go surety for anyone. Meaning that, at least in the financial department, it's not a very wise idea to go surety for someone else. Uh, when you as mom and dad, perhaps you had this come uh, before you, whether or not to co-sign for your youngster to be able to uh, purchase a car because the youngster had not got enough assets in order to purchase the car. So you're going to do it on a time basis. You're going to go into debt to be able to purchase this car. And so you go surety for your son or daughter to get this vehicle. Solomon would probably say, not a very good idea. Let Junior... And of course, I'm relating uh, what happened in my own experience. You get enough money to buy a car, then you go out and buy a car. You don't have enough money to buy a car? Sorry. I guess you've got something to do in order to get what it is you want. So from Solomon's standpoint, going surety for someone else has great risks. Were there any risks for Judah to go surety for his youngest brother, Benjamin? Absolutely. How did he know what the future was going to be? How could he guarantee to his father, well, if it doesn't work out, then put blame on me forever. I will take the uh, blame for it. But we see how Judah carries this out once he gets down to Egypt, because once the brothers all head back down to Egypt to get some more uh, food, find out that, well, uh, Joseph sets up a scenario by which he is going to try to, to snag these uh, brothers in a uh, situation. So things seem to be going well. We're invited to a banquet, to a feast, to a dinner, and good old Benjamin gets five times the amount of food as anyone else. No one seems to be upset by that. The brothers are all seated in order of uh, birth. Uh, that probably causes some question in the mind as to uh, how does this guy know so much uh, about us? But still, nothing flickers. Benjamin gets five times as much. That doesn't seem to uh, bother anyone. So that's a good sign for Joseph that the brothers are willing to allow other people to have favor, even if favors don't come to them, that life isn't always just. Some people get more than others. I don't know that Benjamin was able to eat five times as much as the rest of them. If the rest of them were just given little morsels of food, then five times as much probably was, uh, was okay. So everybody's feeling good. Much better experience than the first time we came down here when we were treated rather roughly and accused of being spies and whatnot. Weren't accused this time around, so they're on their way back home. Officers from the court catch up with them. We think uh, maybe something uh, wrong has happened here, so we need to investigate. So in those days, they didn't need a court order in order to be able to uh, rifle through your car, as it were, in this case, the caravan. 
sacks of food, and lo and behold, came up with a silver cup that belonged to, to the house of Joseph. So it was in Benjamin's sack. Everybody goes back down to Egypt. And they have to stand before Joseph, and Joseph wants to know why, after being treated so well, you deal with me in such a fashion. I want to put Benjamin into prison. The cup was in his sack. Why shouldn't he be the one to be put in prison? So then we have the experience in Genesis that was read for our scripture reading this morning where Judah makes a plea before Joseph. And it is in this plea that we find the kind of character change that has apparently occurred in the life of at least this brother and apparently in the others as well. And he pleads with Joseph, who he does not know is Joseph, that before we came down here this time around, I had to have a conversation with my dad about how our youngest brother, could end up in difficulty if he went along with us. But I promised my dad that if something did, that I would go surety for him, that I would promise my dad that he would be able to come back home. So if somebody has to go to jail, someone has to go to prison, let me be the one that has to go to prison. Because how can I go up to my father and this lad not be with me? That's a phrase that runs throughout Scripture, even though this is the first time that we have seen it. We see the beginnings of it in Genesis all the way down to Revelation. We see it as a being a part of what the gospel is about. We see this carried out when it was uh, on the cross with Jesus. How can I go up to my father and this lad not be with me? Jesus, in coming to this world, chose to come to this world to become surety for us. He made this choice willingly. Judah made this choice willingly in the story of Joseph. He wasn't compelled to. He wasn't presented with a card. Sign your name on this. You'll become surety for your neighbor. You're now responsible. There will be people who were, whose, whose blood you'll be required of if they're lost in the kingdom and they're in your neighborhood. You as uh, Christians, you must become responsible for the people around you. As what happened here. Judah, of his own willingness, of his own desire, of his own heart, went surety for his brother. It wasn't even an issue of whether or not the brother was worthy or unworthy. He became surety for him. We see this in Jesus and the disciples, where Jesus went surety for all 12 of them. We might say, well, why waste your time on the Judases? It's a waste of time. Why spend time on the Judases? They're lost. The temptation for you and I, and this is the reason why we don't, no. Because God in his providence knows human nature all too well. We are not given the privilege to know who is going to be lost and who's going to be saved. Because our tendency would be, Let's not waste our time on the lost, the truly lost, the ones who will never accept uh, salvation. Let's spend our time on those who are redeemable, those who are reformable, those who will be found in the kingdom, and let's let the rest of them go whatever way they want to go. Jesus spent time with Judas because he was willing to go surety for Judas. accepted that, desired it, wanted it. There was never a question about, well, how long do I have to pray for this lost sinner before I get to move on to someone else? How long do we have to pray for these people? When we willingly go surety for someone else, go surety for our neighbor, go surety for that youngster in the church, Go surety for others that do not know Christ. When we become surety, it's, it's a commitment that never ends. Because that's the way love operates. Love does not give up hope 
even when there is very little reason for hope. That's why the scoffers have difficulty when it comes to God isn't fixing this. So guess what? If any fixing is going to get done, it's going to have to be by you and I. Because God certainly isn't doing very much about it. And when you look at World War II, I mean, it started basically in 1939, went to 1945, went for six years. Millions of people lost their lives. Where did it look like God was fixing anything then? It could be, the question could be asked, when does it look like God has ever fixed much of anything in this world? When you look around and, and see all the mayhem and destruction and heartache and starvation and whatever problems we find, what good does it do to pray to God? Oh, yeah. You know, my, my, my little niece, she prayed that uh, Jesus would uh, help her find her kitten, and God answered her prayer. And some people will say, well, oop de doo So he helped the little girl find her little kitten. But he didn't do very much to help save those people out in California. Didn't do very much to save hundreds of people in a hurricane or in a tornado. Oh, yeah, God gets himself uh, involved with the little things in life. But when it really matters, when there's lots of people's lives at stake, God seems to be amazingly absent. So that's why the adage on the New York Daily newspaper, God isn't fixing this, has caused such a row this past week. Because all you Christians want to do is sit around and pray. And what's prayer getting done for you? Well, the question could be asked, what has prayer ever done for much of anyone? Except for a few people here and there to offer some uh, level of hope. Joseph could have looked at life much in the same way. It doesn't look like God's fixing much of anything. The devil's having his way. Look at the life of Job. It didn't look like God was fixing much there either. Letting Satan to have his way, whatever way he wished to have. Cause all kinds of mayhem and destruction. Just don't take Joseph's life. Yeah, well, maybe that would have been better. Took all my children's lives, took everything away from me, health-wise, economic-wise, what have you. What's the point in uh, living uh, some more? Joseph never lost hope. Judah we see he had such a character transformation that he was willing to take his brother's place if that's what was required. And if anyone has to go to jail, Joseph, who we didn't know was Joseph, then let it be me. I will stay in my brother's place. Don't let my father's heart be hurt any further is a dimension that often isn't as emphasized as it should be. We see here that Judah has moved to a more respectful position, a more respectful view of, of his father than what he has had over a period of time. I mean, it wasn't that many years before. Well, getting rid of Joseph, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, let's like, make some money off it as well. We'll get rid of this brother we hate and our father dotes on. We'll accomplish a number of things all at the same time. The thought at the time that good old dad's heart had anything to do to be protected, to be um, managed in some way, wasn't in their mind. But now their heart is different. They think about the father and what might happen to him. How can I go up to my father and the lad not be with me? And what will that do to my father's heart? It's already been broken a time or two before. As far as dad knows, uh, Joseph uh, died a horrible uh, death at the, uh, at, at, at the hands of an animal. When we think about God, what do we think about his heart? If we're not there in God's kingdom, Will that have any influence or effect upon God's heart? When Jesus goes up to his father, how can I go up to my father and you and you not be with me? If I ask the question, does God need us? 
Some are perhaps going to say, no, God doesn't need us because he really doesn't need anybody. How do we know that? How do we know what God needs? How do we know what God wants? How do we know what God wishes? In the destruction of the wicked, for most people, there may come the idea that good riddance to bad rubbish. That's a phrase I grew up with here in America. Good riddance. All you've done is caused uh, harm and destruction, whatnot. And uh, just like Hollywood develops movies, there's always that one scene where uh, finally the good guys win and the bad guys get it on the chops. Yes, because that's what needs to happen. But in the story of uh, Joseph here, you don't get that impression. And you don't get that impression in the New Testament that God has got to get in that final jab against the wicked to finally get some satisfaction. You get the impression that God's heart will have a hole in it for eternity because that which he created, those who he created, even Lucifer and the angels along with him, that God will miss them. You and I have more of the temptation we will not miss him, much like a cat misses a dog. No, not normally. And are we going to miss uh, Satan and his evil angels? No, that would not be my reaction. Good riddance. But a little different perspective when it comes to, uh, to God and his desire for us, his wish for us to be with him. And to what extent he's willing to go. Jesus did not have to come to this earth. Other than if you wish to argue that love propelled and pushed him to come to this earth. And that's a fair argument. But Jesus chose by his own willingness, by his own desire to be able to come to this earth. That he might present to his father his creation. How can I go up to my father and these people not be with me? why when he was resurrected and went to heaven, as we understand in the New Testament, a number of people went up with him to be presented as the first wave sheep offering as evidence that there would be a harvest of people to come. Well, for Joseph, this pretty much was frosting on the cake. It seemed evident to him that the brothers had had such a change of heart a change of mind, a change of attitude, the result of the Holy Spirit finally being able to have its effect upon their, their lives, that it seemed like they had made the test. And as a result of that, he presented himself, himself to them as to who he was, and they were able to have a reunion that none of them had ever anticipated could be possible. There are people that we might go surety for that we may wonder whether or not it's worth the time and the effort. Why should I go through all that effort? Tears and work and years and whatnot. Love really doesn't ask those kind of questions. Love simply says this is worthy, those people are worthy, and I will spend all of my time and my effort and my prayers that they might have a change of heart and mind. That's what love does to individuals. That's what love did to Judah, to Simeon, and to Gad, and to Asher, all the, the brothers. It changed their lives. And those guys were a tough bunch. They were not easily changed. They had strong spirits and strong uh, minds. But it is a story that is uh, worthy of our time to uh, spend with because they had all appeared to come to the point of where they could ask the question, how can I go up to my father and this lad not be with me? What about Benjamin? He seems like an easygoing chap. He could have resisted going down to Egypt. He could have, in his mind, said to the rest of them, why should I go down there for the sake of the rest of you? Well, part of the argument was, Hey, Benjamin, if you don't come down to Egypt with us, we're all going to die. There isn't going to be food for any of us. So in order for this thing to, uh, to happen, 
you've got to come down with us to uh, Egypt. It doesn't look like he argued about it, but that he went along with it in order to be able to save the family. So you see here in this story a group effort to try to accomplish the salvation of everyone involved. How can I go up to my father and my wife, my husband, my child, my next door neighbor not be with me? How can I go through eternity knowing that I did not put the kind of effort and the kind of interest in people that I could have? How can I forgive myself for not doing all that might be possible and to give all that might be possible that I might not break my father's heart, Amen. that I might bring joy to my father's heart? How can I go up to my father and these people not be with us? That's the message that I think is worthy of this time, time of the year when we think of Christ coming to this earth because it was his desire to come to this earth to become surety for you and for me.